order to bail out everybody else. So those are the three things we wanted to do. We wrote the manifesto on a hook, and the hook was the IPCC report, which came out in October. That report was done by 4,500 scientists, and in a certain sense, it's kind of conservative because of that. Because if you try and get consensus amongst 4,500 people, the bar has to be set so all 4,500 agree. And still, it was very uh, you know, alarming to the wider public. So even though the, what the, so what did they say? They said, looking at all the scientific evidence, we only have until 2030 to reduce emissions by 50, well, 45%. Now, as Owen said, if you look at the perma, you know, the, the, they, they had predicted that all across Siberia there's a permafrost, a permanent frosted area of methane. That has now already started to thaw out. Uh, the temperatures we're getting now are not expected yet. So I think we've got to act even quicker. And our argument is that we need to act really, really quickly now and do really important things, right? So the IPCC report is our starting point, but we want to go further than that. So, what we did was, we looked at the four biggest areas of emissions in this country, and they are agriculture, transport, energy generation, and residential energy use. Those four together make up 85% of the emissions in the country. So if you can have effective policies in them four areas, then you're going a long way to reducing emissions in the country. Is that fair enough? So let's start and take you through all four. On agriculture, first of all, the agricultural system in Ireland produces one third of all emissions in the form mostly of methane, not in carbon, but in methane. Now, they mainly come from, from, from dairy and then secondly from beef, right? So if you were just looking at it from an emissions point of view, you would say, right, we've got to get them down immediately. But we're also very concerned with the quality. So if you look at the system, there are two major failings in the agricultural system. One, too many emissions, the second one, though, that interacts with that is really strong inequality. Uh, what are they called? The TASC, TASC, T-A-S-C, which is a think tank, have said when you factor in how long farmers have to work every day to make the money they make, it's the most unequal sector in the whole Irish economy now. I found that a, a surprising statistic. In other words, it's so concentrated around big business that the smaller farmers are squeezed and squeezed, and there is lots of evidence when you look at the beef farmers in that situation. So the facts are that the top 10% of farmers, nearly all of them dairy farmers, take in subsidies that are more than 10 times as much as the average subsidy. Uh, beef far uh, dairy farmers, you know, the biggest farmers in this country, is about 13,500 of them, they take home, on average from the Common Agricultural Policy, 115 grand a year. Now the average payment is only nine. So you have a big block of people who are claiming a massive amount of the, of the subsidy. In beef, it's even more concentrated. There's eight major processing families in this country, and they more or less dictate the life chances and, and so on of 80,000 beef farmers. So, what we want to do is both get emissions down and allow farming people to have sustainability. If you think about it, right, the ABP meats, Liffey meats, Dawn meats, the big, you know, premier dairies, these companies work on the logic of profit. They want to produce more and more and more, no matter what happens. That's their driving logic, right? Uh, that's not true for small and medium farmers. I would argue, and there's a farmer in the room who can tell me if I'm wrong, that most farmers want a sustainable life. They want control of their life so that they're not under massive financial pressure. They want to make sure that they can have continuity so if, they, if their family wants to stay on the land, they can do that. And they want to be able to protect rural Ireland more generally. That's what I think farmers want. Now, that is actually very possible if we break up the power of the massive corporations. The massive agri corporations last year made profits of 3,000 million euros. Well, it was 2.89. That's a massive amount of money. And that gives them massive power over the agricultural system. So what we argue is very simple, right? There's three quarters of the land here is given over to grazing. It's an unusual amount. We think if you were to move towards, and this is the concrete policy, 125,000 hectares each year transitioning from, from, from uh, beef and dairy over to forestry, hemp, you know, beekeeping, whatever it is the farmers want to do, and we can do that in conversation with them, it can be done. Now, the cost from the Department of Finance is 500 million a year to do this. Where would we get the money from? We would take it off them. I mean, they are the polluters. There's a, con there's a concept in economics called externalities. I spoke about it earlier. 
They're making profits by pushing the cost of the pollution onto society. They don't face that cost, but it's a cost that they make. So we want them to pay that cost. We want the pollution charge on the big agri-producers because they make the rest of us pay for pollution. We should make them pay for it. And if we did that, we'd have a 500 million pot which we could use for small and medium farmers who are willing to take socially responsible action, like give over part of their land to agroforestry. We're not saying all of their land. We're only looking at about moving from four and a half million hectares to three million hectares of farming land. So it's not a massive change either. It's about one third of the current land over the course of 10 years. And that would reduce emissions in agriculture by more than 50%. So to summarize, what you're doing is you're looking for a policy that doesn't affect small and medium farmers in a negative way, actually it affects them in a positive way, that increases sustainability in rural Ireland and increases equality in the sector. And that's possible, but you need a lot of farmers behind you. That's why we're talking to the beef farmers about this plan. That's that one, right? Public transport. In Ireland, okay, the, the transport system in this country is linked very much to the neoliberal planning system overall. Why is it that so many people have to have a car well, a lot of people have to commute for work because they live in commuter belts because you can't live in Dublin anymore because it's too expensive and you can't live in Cork. So there's a lot of people having to move for that reason. The biggest corporation in Ireland that's owned by Irish uh, capitalists is Cement Roadstone. They have a strong incentive to keep pumping concrete into the system. Uh, and if you add in then the importance of the tax revenues that come to the government from private transport, they dwarf any investment in public transport. To give you the, the, the kind of magnitude, each year, right, for every one euro the government gives in a public service levy, they get 17 euros from private uh, transport through a variety of excise duties, through uh, car tax, and through all that kind of stuff. So they're getting four and a half billion quid, and they're only spending two, 250 million. See what I mean? So it's a very strong incentive for the, for the private car and the roads industry to be dominant. Now, we think, if you look at Luxembourg now, you look at a number of cities, Tallinn and Estonia, there's, a lot, there's over 50 cities in Europe now have moved to free public transport. Now, free public transport, I would argue, has four key benefits. And when you look at those, they're far, they far outweigh the benefits of private transport. For, first of all, it's about 45 times more efficient in terms of emissions. In Ireland, right, if you drive a car one kilometre and you're one person in the car, the passenger drives a kilometre and so does the vehicle, right? What you see, though, is if you look at the emissions in, uh, in public transport, right, on average, for every kilometre the car drives, it carries 45 people. Does that make sense? So it's actually 45 times, up to 45 times more efficient. The only assumption there is that most car journeys are with one person in the car, and that's not always true, it could be two or three, but in general most people are in one person car journeys. So it's massively more efficient in terms of emissions, that's the first point. Second point, the Chamber of Commerce in Dublin, hardly a radical organisation, they have actually lobbied the government to say that the congestion in the city is not sustainable, and they've done a cost-benefit analysis that says by 2030 it will be costing Dublin, just Dublin, 2.03 billion euros in lost time uh, every year. So the congestion in, in the major cities is really, really bad for people's mental health, but also for time. People are losing a lot of time in traffic. You can get that down considerably if you have a much better public transport system. Third one is air quality, I only alluded to it. 1,500 people every year die in Ireland from air quality problems. You never hear about it. You have massive campaigns for the 150 who die on the roads, but what about the 1,500 who died because of air quality problems? So if you were to have a major investment in public transport, you are much lot more likely to bring down the nitrous oxide which is pumped out from cars every day. And the, the, the fourth advantage is social equality. Uh, the government have estimated that people on general spend about 2,500 euros per annum on a car and about 650 on public transport. If we were to make that free, that option becomes Better for poorer people as well, because as a proportion of their income, poorer people spend more on their private transport than they do, uh, than richer people. So what you're basically saying to people is, if you take the socially responsible option, the more you take of it, the more uh, uh, affordable your transport becomes. So it's a res again, it's, a, it's, it's basically rewarding the population for doing things, not taxing them and charging them uh, to try and uh, 
completely change the environment. So it's, it's a positive policy. So that's public transport. And uh, what we're looking to do there, by the way, and we've costed it, right, this is important, how much would it cost to make every school journey and every third level journey free in the country? It would cost 100 million euros. That's information from the Department of Finance. It's not that much money, really. It's, you know, it's, it's less than, it's, it's about 0.15% of the government's budget. It's, it's very little, right? To get rid of, to make all public transport free is 600 million euros, which is 1% of the government's revenue in a year. And we think, you know, if you can give 5 billion to bankers, uh, the same bankers who wreck the economy, you can certainly give about a tenth of that in public transport subsidies, right? So that's that. And we would invest in, in 500 electric buses every year. They actually pay you back over the running costs over 12 years, right? So that's our policy. I can give you more detail later. Obviously, I'm conscious of how long I'm going to speak for, so I'm going to be quick. Two more policies, then I'm done. The, the one on, the, on, on energy. Energy is actually basically to do with electricity because it's the fossil fuels that are used to create electricity, okay? Now, one of the things I learned in the, in, in the research is that it's an incredibly inefficient process overall. So every time you produce, you know, say you produce 50 units of electricity, right? You have to use nearly 80 units of fossil fuels to get the 50 units because a lot of it is going up in smoke. It's, it's heat energy that's not actually turned into electricity. It's turned into, into, into waste products almost. So, if that's true, shouldn't you definitely not use the very dirty fuels in that process? Because if it's inefficient, you're actually you know, doubling down on, on, on emissions because you're creating uh, electricity through very dirty fuels. Now, the Irish government, of course, doesn't agree with us. So, this year alone, they'll give a 100 million subsidy. There's actually your 100 million I just talked about at one point now because he's a student. Uh, there's your 100 million. Uh, they're giving 100 million quid to produce uh, electricity through peat. Peat is the dirtiest fuel, followed by coal. 80% of the coal that's used in this country now is used in power stations. 75% of the peat that's used in this country is used in power stations. You always have the Ming Flanagan idea that it's all small rural people burning peat in their houses. Three quarters of it comes from big huge power stations. So, there was a report last year that said if we shut down peat and coal immediately, we would be saving the environment, just from money point, just from the biggest power station in the country, 30 million tonnes of CO2 between now and 2025, which is half of all emissions in one year. So if you just did that one thing, you would reduce emissions massively. Like, just put that in context, you know, Ryanair, the biggest airline and the worst polluter in Europe for airlines, produces 10 million tonnes in one year. So you'd be getting three years of Ryanair out of the picture just by doing that. But the Irish government isn't going to do that it's actually going to continue to subsidise electricity from the dirtiest fuels. Now, that would be, that's even more reprehensible when you know you can actually create a lot of electricity now from wind energy. Wind started off, in this, in this century, we had 0% of our energy coming from wind. In 2002, zero. Today, we have 27% of our energy comes from wind. So it's a deliverable, achievable, provable technology. It has been proven. The government's climate action plan is a terrible plan. The only thing I thought was good in it, one of the only things, is that they are actually committed to increasing the wind capacity in this country so that 70% of all of our energy can come from wind by 2030. If that happens, that would be a very good thing, right? But they're also, the caveat in there is that they also expect demand for energy, for electricity to go up by 50%. Why would that be? because they want to bring in the Googles, the Amazons, the Facebooks to build big, huge data centers which gobble up electricity. In their own plan, they admit that they want 31% of all electricity in Ireland to go to the data centers, which I think is a disgrace, it's outrageous. So what we say is use the same level of investment but cut out the data centers and suddenly your 70% of final demand becomes 90%. And you can create 90% of your energy from wind and the other 10% is the, the, the energy you need for the intermittent process. In other words, it, it plugs the gaps for you when there isn't wind or whatever, until the technology improves. So that technology is already exists and it's possible to implement now. That would cost about two billion euros a year, which again gives a return because now a unit of electricity from, from wind is cheaper to produce than a unit of electricity from, from, uh, from fossil fuels. That's, these are facts that are out there, right? So that's what we would do there. Finally then on residential. Uh, residential energy um, uh, accounts for the, the fourth biggest block, and I'll explain at the very end, I'll summarise this. 
In Ireland at the moment, the technology is available again for deep, what's what's called deep retrofitting. Uh, the emissions from housing are as follows. On average, Irish houses emit seven, sorry, burn 7% more fossil fuels and use 7% more energy than the average in Europe. So it's only a bit higher. But because the old stock and because of the inefficiencies, we're actually at 60% more emissions. So the Irish housing stock is 60% more emissions from 7% more energy use, which is a terrible uh, efficiency ratio, right? So what we do is we say, well, how would you get it down? There's a thing called BER, which is the energy rate. And what's it mean again? The B, I can't remember what the B stands for. Building. B right. <laughs> Building energy rate, the BER, right? And they have a scale. And in that scale, they show basically from A to G. A being the most efficient homes, G being the, less, the least efficient homes. And the, the ratio is phenomenal. If you're in an old, you know, very open home, the amount of energy you use to, to, to have a, a decent standard in the home, and I'm looking obviously use it, use it, you can you can show me how, how how much better you can do it again, but the average is 20, 10 to 25 times worse than the A rated home. So in other words, you can make your home between 10 and 25 times more efficient if you have the right insulation and the right energy mix. Now that's possible, but you see the government's plan to do that is one which will punish people again, especially poorer people. What their argument is, is that they're going to let the private sector offer people loans, private loans, to take out a big loan, it might be 30, 40 grand, and you go off and do it yourself, and then you pay back the loan at interest. I think that's outrageous. What we want to do in People Before Profit is to say this, set up a national energy company, make that company responsible for the deep retrofitting, Avail of the economies of scale that come from that because you're doing not just 20 houses or you know the biggest company might be able to do 5,000 houses in a year. We want to do 100, 100,000 houses but you need a massive company to do that. And we would give upfront loans to people from the state. So we wouldn't say you've got to come up with the money from some private banker. We'd say we're going to give you the money up front, 40 grand. And then what we're going to do is we're going to check how much your energy bills go down by. And if they go down by 2,000 euros a year, we'll take that back until we get the money back. So in other words, you'll benefit from lower energy costs, especially when the whole thing is sorted. The whole country will benefit from, uh, from uh, lower emissions. And actually, even the return to the government we worked out would be 8% a year, which is a high return on its investment. Because there's actually, you know, there's a, there's a return on the, on the amount of... Um, uh, cost that they, because at the moment they have a scheme called the SEAI, which is the government scheme for, for retrofitting, and they have to pay for that. So if you did it this way, you'd get a return. So to summarise, right, you have four areas there. At the moment, those four areas are, 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 are costing about 52 or 53 million tonnes of CO2 annually. And what we showed is you can get in agriculture 10 out. You can show in, in, in transport, you can get about three or four out, that's 13. In wind, you can get about 11 out because it's a, such a massive transformation. That's about 21, 24. And then in, uh, in the last one, over the course of 10 years, you can get that down by about 90% as well. So it's under five out. So we're talking 30 million tons or so out of 50 odd million tons just by relatively painless uh, initiatives that would be done over the course of a decade. And they would make transport cheaper, they would make sure rural life was more efficient and was more sustainable, they would make sure that homes were more efficient and that people would move out of uh, uh, energy poverty, and they would make sure that we get rid of the dirtiest fuels in the energy system. Will it happen? It will not happen unless we have a people power movement that makes what is good sense into common sense. This kind of stuff will be written off as pie in the sky unless we have people banging on the door of the Fine Gaelers and the big polluters who will never change unless we have a movement. So the whole logic of why we did this meeting today was to say we have good ideas, but the ideas mean very little unless they're put into action in the streets, and therefore I'm also making the appeal to people, if you like our ideas, get involved with People Before Profit, whether that means joining us right now, which we'd love, or even leaving your details so we can continue the conversation. But in the end, we're going to need a lot more people than we have currently because we do know that Fine Gael will never protect the environment over the profits of big business. Thanks.